Hello and welcome to the Alliance of Independent Authors Self-Publishing Advice Podcast and this is our foundational um, stream for beginner self-publishers. I'm here with Sasha Black as always. Hi Sasha. Hello, good evening. You're looking very fetching, I have to say this for you, very nice shade of lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, it's only because I'm trying to cover up my very red cheeks because I've just got in from chain trading. <laughs> <laughs> it works. It works. Distract from the cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> Balance you out. So yeah, today we are going to be talking about what we're calling bare bones publishing for beginner indie authors. And the idea of this podcast essentially is, you know, there's an ideal way to do things, and and uh, when we set up a business, there are all sorts of things we want to be able to do. But then there's reality, time and money and lots of other things are in limited supply and some of us are working day jobs when we start out and all sorts of other things going on. So we were having a conversation about what would be the absolute bare minimum that would allow somebody to get up, get started, get running with their um, publishing without having to overinvest at this point in time and then knowing that you know you could build on that as time goes on so that's our topic for this evening but before we get to that we um also like to take a look at the ally blog what's going on over there because Sasha, of course is editor on the blog and also a little bit about what she's up to in her publishing so what's going on for you let's talk about the blog first Okay, so on the blog uh, today, we had a post about uh, sort of that wide focus again uh, that we do love in Ally and looking at alternative sales outlets. So there's lots of outlets that are, uh, you know, sort of uh, looking at smaller markets across the world, uh, different types of platforms where you can sell your books um, alongside some case studies from members as well. And then I, I don't quite remember the week order, but in the last month since our last podcast we've also had a really cracking uh post from debbie uh who used to manage the blog who wrote about finishing a series and got a ton of really uh awesome quotes from members as well looking at all of the different ways there were stacks of ideas like i came away with stacks of ideas about um just like different things that i can do with my series how to end it whether or not you you whether or not you end and then it go back and extend and things like this so that was really good and then in amongst that lot there was also one on like finding followers and fans uh, which was super helpful as well so yeah that's what what's been on the blog lots going on there as always and these of course are our monday posts which tend to be in-depth big posts sometimes two or three thousand words and always about two thousand words it's our minimum two thousand words sometimes <laughs> three sometimes even more and uh, mm -hmm. they're in-depth posts that, that ultimate guides really to that particular topic that we run on Mondays. But of course, we've also got our Twitter chat on when, um, on Tuesday, Tuesday. Our news on Wednesdays, and occasional posts from our watchdog desk on Thursdays, and lots mm -hmm. of other things going on. So there is almost always something new on the blog, almost daily at selfpublishingadvice.org. So yes, and tell us a little bit about what you've been publishing. Uh, so I have just finished formatting a reader magnet uh, for my fiction readers. So um, I just really had to just change my mindset around short fiction. I'd sort of convinced myself I couldn't do it and I absolutely can do it. So I've, yeah, I've had that back from the editor and I finished formatting that today. So I'm going to launch that the beginning of June and then um, I am in the throes of doing the final bits of editing on uh, my next non-fiction book which is Eight Steps to Side Characters. So I'm very excited for that. How about you? Fantastic. Yes, well I've just finished um, Creative Self-Publishing, the ebook version and getting some feedback on that and we'll do a final um, version for print shortly with an index. So um, mm. great to have that up and out there at last. And um, people who've been following for a while know that, that has taken a while, um, but it is well, my attempt to do a really comprehensive, in-depth look at all the different aspects of self-publishing. And of course, it's dedicated to Ally members and it's really packed with, with all sorts of stuff from the team, yourself uh, included, and uh, lots 
of our members advice. So yeah, that, that's that one. And now finishing the planners that accompany that. So needed that to be out to finish the planners, which have also been hanging around for a long time. So uh, that should be finished by the end of the month, hopefully. Mm. So yes, let's get to our topic today, which, as I said, is foundational um, look at bare bones publishing. And we're going to go through the seven stages of the publishing process um, and look at each of these, what is kind of bare bones in each stage and phase of the process. But first thing I wanted to say was that, uh, you know, no matter what, how little time or money you have, essentially, when you are starting off um, as a self-publishing author, you are going into business. And sometimes when we're starting off, we don't realize that. So the ideal uh, would be, you know, businesses invest up front. If you were opening a cafe, you would have to borrow and the money that is necessary, you know, to have tables and chairs. As authors, we don't need to do that. But the ideal for an author business would be probably to budget for two years ahead um, or three books ahead and work out the living expenses it would take for that time and work out you know, the, the publishing expenses. That would be the ideal. But yeah. what, would bare, what would bare bones be, do you think? Well, I was just going to say, I think it can, I think you have to work out what your goal is because some people are publishing just because they want a published book and aren't necessarily publishing to create a career out of it however it is still a business so you know I think there is just that that bit of separation but yeah and then obviously then the, the, there's the people who want to do this full-time as a career and of course they are going into business in terms of like bare bones I think everybody gets very worked up about assuming you have to pour loads of money and that money is the thing that you invest. And yes, to a certain extent, you can invest lots and lots of money, but there are also other ways around it if you don't have money. So I still like, I 100% deeply believe that everything that you publish should be to a professional standard, but that doesn't mean you have to pay money. So for example, if you network and you make friends with um, other people, then you can exchange skills. So let's say you're really good um, proof that you pick up comma mistakes or capital letter mistakes or whatever, um, then you can exchange your skills for somebody who perhaps it is a professional cover designer in their day and, and loves to moonlight as a writer in the evening. So there are, you know, and in that case, you're exchanging skills and time rather than spending and investing upfront money. Like whatever happens at bare bones, you are going to have to invest something. The decision you have to make as a publisher, as an author, as a marketer is, do you want to invest money and throw money at the problem? Do you want to invest time? Uh, do you want to invest your skills? I think you know, we don't have to be as rigidly stuck to assuming it's going to cost us three grand in editing and two grand in colors and, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's just not the case. And I think lots of people come to this worrying that they are going to have to find a massive lump sum. Um, I do, you know, I do want to impress the fact that you should be publishing to a professional standard, but that doesn't mean it has to cost you a bazillion bucks to do it. So yeah, keep expenses low, I think, uh, starting mm -hmm. out as low as you possibly can. Um, try not to borrow, probably, if, again, if possible, but do if you feel it, you're going to get a, a return on investment. So the time to, to borrow is when you've actually tested something, not just uh, borrowing for the sake of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so yeah, and, and that bartering is all important. Sorry, yeah. Uh, well, I was just going to say on the borrowing front, because we are such a low investment startup, I always think it's dangerous. And this is just my personal uh, opinion. I always feel it's dangerous to uh, borrow money to start. But when you look at any other business, that is pretty much what they have to do to get business loans, um, you know, from the bank or for, from whatever, wherever. The one thing that I would say is if you are intending on borrowing the money, then like don't just quit your job it, it, it if you're going to borrow make sure you have a mechanism to pay back that money that 
isn't necessarily from book royalties. Make sure you have a different income stream that is guaranteed because otherwise you can get into trouble. But, you know, we are not financial accountants. We are not tax people. This is just, you know, personal hard school of Knox lessons. <laughs> yeah. And, and on the borrowing, I think one of the difficulties with this particular business is that very often you don't know what works until you try. So you, you're all mm -hmm. convinced that something is going to yield a return and it doesn't and then something completely takes you by surprise over here problem if you borrow is that you you can you know borrow for the wrong things and very often it takes a while to learn it's not like setting up a business say if you have skills and, and a, a you know experience and a track record in that business mm -hmm. if you're beginning self-publishing you don't have a clue because it's a very much a learning by doing kind of thing and so yeah borrowing at the beginning the time to borrow is probably when you're two years in and you know exactly mm -hmm. what, what's going to yield a good result or if you're advertising and you're getting a return on your investment and therefore you want to scale up and you have empirical data showing you that if you continue to scale, you will continue to see a return on your investment. That is also the prime time to think about borrowing money. Uh, I know a few people who've done that and really coined in, in the money, but they had the data to prove that they were going to make a return on their investment. So, yeah. They're so usually about two years in, I think, as well. You know, it takes that. Yeah. Time. Get the books under your belt and, and the ads, because ads is not something, it's very, very seldom happens that somebody just does a winning ad from the from, Straight off, but advertising absolutely learning your reader and so on. Okay, uh -huh. so let's let's be a little bit more specific, unless there's something else you wanted to say on the general front. No, I was going to say that's not the only mindset thing, though. So what what else? What what other mindset things are bare bones? Well, the I think from Ally's point of view, we would say very much to stick to the principle of non-exclusivity. And um, so particularly when starting out, just realizing that and putting all your money into or sorry, all your efforts into one outlet is not good business practice. Again, back to this idea of being, um, you know, we're assuming that people who are listening here want to ultimately make a living from their writing because that's generally the, that's the core of our, our membership. So to publish ideally, again, the ideal would be to publish as widely as possible and as deeply as possible. So as many outlets as you can and as many formats as you can, that's the ideal. But again, time, money being precious at the beginning, the bare bones is probably to, may not be that, it may be to, while holding the principle of non-exclusivity in mind, you may um, do less at the beginning than you would um, ideally. Yeah, so like using an aggregator, for example, which means you're still wide, but you're, you don't necessarily do a me and have 5,000 platforms every time you change something in the back matter that you have to upload to. <laughs> exactly. um, yeah, very good yeah. Example. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then the other mindset, um, sorry, I think you're going to say something there again. There seems to be a little drag on the line tonight. Oh, no, I was just going to say, and um, what about, uh, well, I was going to move on to the next point, so that's why. Yes, yeah, when you do that. Do you do? Oh, so, so I think it's having an open mind to learning from, you know, putting into action, taking action, being okay with making mistakes. So, for example, uh, on the second nonfiction book I published, I uploaded the wrong file to the pre-order, which then promptly locked. And published published the wrong book and it was horrific and I learned a very very good lesson uh about triple quadruple checking all files before you hit upload um and opening uh the previewer <laughs> in, in, the, in the thing to double check you've done the right thing so like and it's embracing that lesson I mean it it was so painful at the time and I was mortified and there were quite a few hundred books that had gone out that were wrong um but, you know, I learned the lesson and took it on the chin. And actually, I turned it into a piece of content in the end because I, I had something to share with people. Um, and so I think it's that openness to, to accepting that things are going to go wrong the first time or the second time or even, you know, stuff still goes wrong now. Um, 
because this is complicated and there are lots of different boxes you have to tick and things you have to change and prices you have to look at and all this stuff um and so you know it's it's just that reassurance to say to anybody who's beginning at this that it's okay if you make mistakes. Even seasoned pros still make mistakes. And the wonderful thing about being indie is you can fix it real quick. So, you know, nothing is irreversible. Nothing at all is irreversible. Um, I ended up contacting Amazon and within 48 hours, they had pushed out the correct file to the people who had pre-ordered. So, you know, I was mortified, but actually I learned a lesson. I've taken that as a positive. I've uh, never made the same mistake again. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I think there is something something around lesson learning and, and learn being okay with mistakes. Absolutely. And as you say, we all make them. Joanna Penn and I um, did a whole pro, a whole show recently on all our mistakes, <laughs> all the things we did wrong. Even Joanna Penn makes mistakes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yes. Um, uh, and thanks for sharing that. That's really, really important. And I think the other thing that at the beginning that's really important to hold on to is you are going to want to move faster than you are able to move. Uh, you know, there's never enough time. And <laughs> you are, because you're learning as you're making those mistakes, they are inevitable because you're learning three really complex processes at the same time, writing, publishing, and running a business, each of which needs different skills. So, you know, while your ideal would be to have, you know, 24 hours of writing and publishing every day in a quiet, dedicated space and, you know, and all the time and money you needed, that's the ideal. It's not going to happen. Bare bones mm -hmm. publishing means take every time block that you can, take those mistakes, don't waste creative energy on kicking yourself or whatever, keep moving forward. Uh, bare bones publishing is all about recognizing the imperfection while not letting it stop you, putting productivity ahead of perfectionism and just, you know, getting getting stuff out there. And the other thing that with the time blocking, if it's possible, batch your tasks by type of task. I I know this won't suit everybody, but I find that um, if I have like a whole bunch of scheduling or I have like social media images that need creating for like review quotes, but tips quotes as well. And then just promotional images rather than doing one on a Wednesday and one on a Saturday. I just batch them all into one time block because they're all the same type of task. Um, and I find that reduces the overwhelm, like the launch overwhelm, um, because I'm crossing off an entire section, an entire type of launch work in one go. Um, and it also, see, I seem to then punk through the um, launch tasks faster than, than I do when I'm just like a big chaotic mushroom. Mushroom? Whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and everybody has their different ways and mm. finding out what yours are is a matter of experimentation and exploration. So, you know, you may be convinced that, like, for example, Sasha, you were talking at the beginning, I was convinced I couldn't do short um, stories and there. I did it and now I can. So, you know, not being too wedded to having to have particular things in place, but trying lots of different ways of doing things until you settle on the way that works for you. You'll have loads of people telling you what works for them and, you know, swearing by something that has been, you know, worked well for them. They share that with the best of intentions, but sometimes that's not what's right for you. There's only one way to find out. So doing everything in that spirit of experimentation and exploration, I think, is really important, especially at the beginning. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at some specifics. What about editorial? I mean, that's one of the biggest expenses time-wise yeah. and money-wise and it's the one that all the beginners want to skip and um, you know yeah. everybody when they're starting out doesn't want to get an editor the more experienced you are as a writer I think the more you value um, editors I mean there are exceptions but it's the general rule so what's bare bones for an editor do you think it's really thing? difficult yeah I mean it's really difficult isn't it because if this is your first book then realistically, you do need a developmental edit, whether you like it or not, like, 
you don't know everything about writing and therefore you will learn something from a developmental edit. However, developmental edits are notoriously expensive and not everybody is in the privileged position to be able to afford it. So what? So really, I don't think anybody can get away with publishing without professional standard feedback, professional standard editing. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean, like we said at the beginning, that you're paying thousands of pounds for it. Uh, you could beg, borrow and steal uh, from friends or or network in, in the industry. Or you can, you know, you can have a collective of people uh, proofing for you. So, for example, um, I have mine professionally edited, but then I don't pay for a proofer. I uh, get my ARC team to do the proofing for me. So, um, and usually there's only about 20 mistakes left by the time it gets to um, my advanced reader team. So, you know, I only have to make a handful of changes at that point, but it's gone through multiple rounds of self edits. It's gone through critique partners who are, um, uh, you know, uh, professional writers, peers uh, who have given feedback on it. And sometimes that feedback looks more like a developmental edit and sometimes it looks more like a sort of factual line level copy type edit just depends on where you are in in the process i run it through pro writing aid <laughs> so it's another form of editing this one by a sort of computer you know and, and that is uh, considerably less than a paid editor but then i go and give it to a professional editor um and then after that i then have my advanced team proof for me you know and pick up any so i mean i can't i've lost count of how many different rounds of editing that is but it's a lot of rounds of editing and so not all of those are paid edits but it is a collective that by the end of all of those different rounds of editing um it is a professionally level um edited book so I mean, in terms of like very, very bare, like if you if you can't afford, if you can't, if you don't have critique partners, you don't have, um, you can't afford a developmental edit. I think the very least you can do is a proof because it's the cheapest form um, of editing. But in my humblest of humble opinions, please give your book to another writer or author or, or professional peer to to give feedback on. I don't know how you feel about that, Orna, but that's where yeah, I've I have to do I think that's bare bones you know to get outsiders eyes the 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 less um of a track record they have professionally uh, then the more opinions you need so if it's a beta read you know by readers you need lots and lots if it's um somebody who's a well published writer who's been you know in your niche and has been through this many many times then yeah you don't need as many of those but and if it's a professional developmental editor you know one developmental edit will do so but get if you're not able to afford the the professional developmental edit then get a variety of opinions and input as mm. variables um i would also say leave time between your final draft and getting your editorial done and your own self-editing will be better. You will read it more as an outsider uh, if you're less attached to it. And I think a, a proofreading at the end by a qualified proofreader, not your Auntie Margie, who's you know, a stickler for punctuation, but somebody who actually is trained, has a qualification in proofreading, because proofreading isn't as easy as it looks. And no. um, so, yeah, I, that is actually sounds like an awful lot, but that is actually bare bones, I think. Mm. And one, one other tip, um, make sure that you read your book proof, your physical proof, because um, it, if when you spend so long reading it on a screen, it's a totally different experience and you will find that you, no matter how many times it's been checked, you will pick up things in the physical proof. So that is always my very last line of defense is to read my own book physically one last time, even though it's super painful because I've read it 75,000 times. Yeah, you're sick of it by then. So oh, sick. So sick. <laughs> the other thing you can do is get the, um, you know, that text reader to actually read it mm. for you. And that can be, and listen back to that while you're proofing. Particularly, some of us are more al alert to our own mistakes than others, but none of us is particularly alert. You know, your your eyes just skim over things that you've created, mistakes you've created yourself. You don't see them. Agreed. So, yeah, mm. we're spending a lot of time on editorial 
folks, but that's because editorial is probably the single most important and most time, you know, time expensive and money expensive thing you'll have to do in the whole process of publishing. Yeah, one other thing just on, on editing. Um, if you are intending on more crowdsourcing your editing than, um, you know, paying professional editors, it's also really important to bear in mind what English people speak. So are they British English speakers? Are they American English speakers, Canadian English speakers? Because everybody has different systems. And so you may find that you're getting conflicting um, uh, editorial advice. And that's another reason for paying a professional editor, because they will, uh, you know, obviously be able to edit in the correct English or, or, or other language if you are, you know, Spanish European Spanish versus Brazilian Spanish or, or whatever it is that you're writing in. Yes, and um, they have the consistency thing and they will work to, you know, Chicago Manual of Style or whatever, exactly. and, you know, and so and this is the way in which, you know, somebody who may be good at picking up on the mistakes isn't necessarily giving you the consistency that a, a professional editor would give you. Yeah. Design? Design. Well, ideally, again, if we just talk about the ideal, first of all, ideally, you hire a professional book designer who has experience in your genre in, in, and your niche and knows exactly what kinds of books in, sell in, in your world. But I think bare bones means that some, you know, for people who cannot afford to do that, to get a one off exclusive design from a professional. There is the pre-made option where you can actually mm -hmm. um, purchase a pre-made by designers and they will, you know, it's considerably cheaper, usually about, you know, quarter to half the price. And mm -hmm. it is yours. It's individual. It's not um, it's not something that turns up again and again, but because it's kind of pre-made by the designer, it doesn't have as much um, of their input into it. It's 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 a cheaper option um and then of course there's all always the kind of skill swapping bartering of skills that we were talking about earlier on that's also an option if you do know somebody but i would stress that you know it's not your local designer or graphic designer in some other field book design is a very specialist um thing and you know people need to know how to do book design it's a it's a different anything to add there no, I, you know, just don't do it on Canva yourself. <laughs> yes, <please. laughs> to put it bluntly, just don't, just, just don't. You um, know, you can get a pre-made for like fifty dollars, you know, or you know, some even cheaper than that. Uh, uh, so yeah, just, just don't do it yourself. <laughs> yes, yeah. unless you've got the skills, of course. If you, if you actually yes, have, to, yes. I, and you know, we, I do know some authors who have managed to do it successfully. But I also look at lots and lots of um, indie published books where authors have done it themselves and they don't know their book, their covers really letting their book down and they don't realize mm -hmm. it. So don't be that author. OK, um, so production then. What's ideal for production in your mind? Sasha? Well, this is an interesting one. So by production, do you mean like the formatting, the physical creation of it or? Yeah. OK, so yes. for me, um, this is really interesting because up until a few years ago, I would have said, oh, you know, pay somebody to format your book. But actually, there are now lots and lots of free or cheap over the course of your career options. So, I mean, Vellum is a piece of software that's $250 or whatever it is, um, which is then yours for life. And so you only have to publish two, I would say, books and you've already made your, your money back because professional formatting can start from probably $100, $150 upwards. Um, you know, but then there are also a very professional free templates. So I really think this one is a bootstrapping uh, version. Uh, uh, one of the seven processes, this of all of them you can bootstrap because ReadZ and Drafty Digital do these fantastic free templates where you can actually just drop your text into. You can add little images for the top of the, the chapters or whatever. And, and they create wonderful ebooks. So you know, there is no reason really to pay for formatting unless you want something snazzy and you know, different, some black pages or different, I don't know, whatever fancy things and tables and illustrations and all that kind of stuff. You know, and if you do, um, 
want to have those fancy things in or if for example you're a children's book author and you've got to have it all professionally done in 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 your photo shops shops and your illustrators then then fine but actually of all of the processes i think this one is the the easiest to get free templates uh, uh from so yeah i mean the point is i read um Oh, this is controversial. Oh, I read an ebook the other day from a non-fiction author, indie non-fiction author who is very well known, and um, <clears throat> I was very disappointed because I was reading it on my Kindle, and it would jump from one section and uh, not even to a new section, and the and the font sizes were all different, the headers were all different, and I just couldn't believe that in this day and age there were still books that were not formatted to a professional standard and I tell you what it really put me off because I was like it's so easy to make a professional looking in a interior of your ebook um and it's just lazy not to to be perfectly honest um and don't treat your readers like that so that's my rant over the podcast. okay thank you for that <laughs> <laughs> and I think the other important thing to say about production is if you know ideally you'll do lots of formats you'll do ebook you'll do your pod version you can now do pod in a hardback a large print as well as a paperback you may also do a consignment print run for your own use uh, you know for marketing promotion because it's it's, it's cheaper and then, of course, there are audiobooks. Now, mm -hmm. each of these are, in, you know, more it gets more expensive as you go up the line. You don't have to do them all at the beginning. Uh, you know, bare bones publishing is probably limiting yourself to ebook until you yeah. get some money, and then you can invest in in print and audio, the other formats. So, yeah, have a think, have a think about that because sometimes people assume they have to do print, and you don't not not in, not if you're doing the bare bones if that's what you want to do mm. okay so the next um publishing process is distribution so yeah ideally again uh, we, we mentioned this one already i think earlier um ideally you would upload directly to the big five which would be amazon kdp apple google play kobo and ingram spark but if you're doing bare bones you might use just one aggregator like draft digital or publish drive or street lib and just do ebook only through those and you will reach a lot of outlets with your book and you can get used to marketing and promotion then on the ebook before you invest a lot of time and energy into lots of different formats on lots of different outlets anything to add yeah that? straightforward no, I, don't think, I think it is yeah yeah Okay, so what about marketing then? What's ideal, first of all? Well, ideal, I think it depends which book you are publishing, because if it's your first book, you can get away with doing a lot less. Um, I think once you get to book three, you then have much more of an opportunity to get a return on your investment. So assuming you are intending on, you know, uh, making a career out of this, you need a website or landing page, some way for readers to contact you, reach you, find out about you. Um, you need some kind of a plan. Um, in, you know, how are you going to market your books? Um, and two things on that. One is uh, that it's, well, no, just one thing with, just one thing. It's not just about launch day. It's not just about launch week. That plan should include, uh, you know, smaller uh, repeat uh marketing efforts for the long term for a month after for three months after for six months after because there will always be new people finding your book and therefore um your book it will always be like launch day to those new readers even if it's not launch day for you um and for me personally i think in this day and age the the thing that is absolutely bare bones is a mailing list um you know you you need we are independent the whole point is to be independent and therefore um creating your own mailing list and there are free options mailchimp for example is free for the first 2000 subscribers so there's no excuse for not having a mailing list and collecting um readers and so i suppose in that train of thought as well then you probably need a reader magnet because otherwise you're not gonna you're not likely to get signups so that would be bare bare bones but again you can create a read reader magnet for free um so there's yeah that, that those would be like bare bones yeah yeah so 
from a marketing perspective, what we're what you're trying to do is think long term, set up a funnel, you know, create yeah. your 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 reader magnet, have a mailing list, have a sign up form on your website, have your own website, have your own uh, domain, make sure you own your own little corner of the internet. Don't set up on Facebook book page or whatever as as your landing page do uh, invest that small amount of money that it takes to own your own thing and to build up over time so um i think this comes back to the mindset thing of thinking long term while doing immediately just what can be done and um, mm -hmm. and, and a little something all you know all the time think of marketing as little and often rather than a huge big thing that you have to do at launch time and then doesn't happen again and um, that is the trade publishing model because in trade publishing your book only gets six to twelve weeks on the shelf and it only gets that time period to sell whereas um in digital publishing there's a backlist as, as sasha said when a, a reader meets a book it's new to them and you can mm -hmm. keep putting your energy behind it continuously so that brings us into promotion really doesn't it a kind of a, a slow burn um of promotion all the time is the ideal you know that you've got a newsletter promo going on you've got ads maybe going in a cycle or you've got a, a, a giveaway cycle or or whatever um but bare bones uh, might be just organic use of social media for now just trying to bring people to that um, mailing list of yours or even just letting it lie until you have a bit more stock and not investing in promotion until, um, as Sasha said, you get to book three. Mm -hmm. And Thanks. so the final, sorry, did you have something else on promotion? No, no, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, <laughs> we keep tripping over each other tonight. There's a slight drag on the line. Um, okay, so our final, I think you were going to say, is rights licensing and management. And this is something you don't need to worry at, about at the beginning. But again, there's a mindset around rights. Um, and the most important thing with rights is that you don't hire a service that, uh, you know where you inadvertently lose your rights or transfer your rights assign your rights over to somebody who uh, and then you can't actually uh, do your rights licensing and management when the time comes and you're and you're seeing some success so i think that's all you need to think about in relation to that do you have anything to add on that one no no nope Okay, um, if you are interested in knowing more about rights, you can you can take a look at um, our indie um, author rights um, guide and we have we also have, um, you know, guides to each of these sections we've only been able to kind of skim the top of it here during this podcast but um, as members of Ally, you just need to download, go to the guidebooks page in the member zone and download the guidebook that is relevant for the phase and stage that you are at. And we're constantly adding to those guides now. And um, if you're not a member, you can find them at selfpublishingadvice.org forward slash shop. And um, yeah, there's the blog as well if you want to key into the blog at any time the search term for the particular process that you're in um, or stage that you're at or whatever your challenge is if you just use the search um, function there to, to key in it really is good in terms of bringing you back all the different articles that we've done on that particular topic over the years so that is bare bones publishing for beginners hopefully that was useful to you any last words sasha I don't think so. Enjoy. Right. Enjoy publishing and writing. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> happy, happy writing and happy publishing. And I see your chair got a mention. <laughs> the throne <laughs> got a mention in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'm going to leave us with just, we have a comment from Bernice, um, which is I think around the design. There are different types of covers with designers, which is often missed. An illustrator cover will cost more. Yes, the designer may commission an illustrator to do it, but asking a designer to source a photo or supply um, a photo is less um, expensive once copyright is cleared. So thank you, Bernice, for that comment. I think, um, 
yes, Bernice is you work with Indies and is a is a designer herself. Oops, someone else loving the throne. Okay, <laughs> we better get out of here before the throne gets a, a big head. So thank you all for being with us this evening. And uh, yeah, happy writing and happy publishing. We'll see you next week for self-publishing poetry advice. Until then, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.